Oh, we're on. I'm looking at the, um, the Facebook feed, which is a few seconds behind. So good morning, everyone. Great to be with you here from Blackpool in the center of Blackpool, the town that we love and we pray for and we're part of. So it's just great to be at our campus here, which we are open and uh, just wonderful. So um, today, Mothering Sunday, couldn't have planned this better. I'm gonna be looking at one of the great mums in the Bible who's uh, already been mentioned. Her name's Hannah and she's in the Old Testament and her story's right at the beginning of um, the books of Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter one, verse one, and uh, there she is. And it's her story we're looking at this morning. But as we just get going with that, I'd like to ask you a question just to think about. Think of the last thing that you desperately wanted. Okay, think of the last thing that you desperately wanted. You know, was it a cup of tea? Was it whatever, you know, it, what was it that you wanted? How did you feel about that? How desperate were you? Could be a big thing, could be, you know, thinking about somebody else or thinking about something in your own life that you needed to happen. But that sense of, oh God, oh God, something's got to give, something's got to happen. And that's the story we're looking at this morning in the life of Hannah. We've been on a series looking at different kinds of prayer in our prayer rooms. So we began by looking at Isaiah 56 verse 7, which talks about the mountain of God and uh, my house will be a house of prayer. The very words Jesus talked about and the importance uh, and the, the, the fabric of the church is a life of commune with God in prayer. We looked at the story of Moses and how Moses um, held his arms up with his staff of authority whilst Joshua fought a battle. And when his arms got tired and he put his arms down, um, you know, the battle went in favor of the enemy. But then when he put his arms back up, uh, Joshua, you know, his spiritual son started to win his battles again. And so we looked at the, the three places we can be in prayer. We can either be in the battle and needing the prayer, or we can be the one watching the battle and praying for those who are going through it right now. But sometimes we need to be those who can pray for the carers, pray for the ones who are helping others. And, and so we look at that as like a prayer triplet, if you like, a trinity of prayer. And today what we're looking at is fervent prayer, the need to be moved in prayer, the need for our emotions to get involved in our praying. And someone once said, if it's not moving you in prayer, it's probably not moving God either. And so we want to be those people who um, are moved by what's moving the heart of God and aligning ourselves with him. But also to remember that God is moved by you. And so there are times even in the life of Jesus, as he walked through the, the world and he met with people, it says his heart was moved to compassion for that person. And we see something of the heart of God in the, in the stories of Jesus. But there's a great passage for us as well as we think about this and we think about Mother's Day. And often mums are, they, they're just so emotional, aren't they? They can be emotional, but um, they're, they're just so connected in their hearts to what's going on. Guys, we tend to think about things in a cerebral way. We're fixers. We like to have an answer to all the problems. But while we're figuring out the answer to all the problems and trying to fix everything, mums come alongside people. They put their arms around them. They draw them in. And Jesus said of Jerusalem that God was like that mother hen who wanted to just put his arms around the people of God. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, how I would have gathered you like a mother hen gathers her chick. So we have an amazing insight into the bigness of God's heart and his, that component that we see so often in moms and in ladies. And we want to honor um, that part of our humanity called woman today. And it isn't just wives. It isn't just moms. It's womanhood. And we've heard in the news recently about yet another dreadful attack on womanhood and uh, uh, you know the murder of this precious young woman in in society that rocked us in the UK shocked us we've been appalled at that dreadful situation 
and I listened yesterday to the radio and it was, you know, the usual talking heads and um, someone asked a really stupid question, which was what, what can society do to fix this problem about um, inequality for women and um, lack of safety? I just thought, what a stupid question. There is no such thing as the, you know, oh, look, there, over there, there's society walking past driving that car. There's no such thing as society. Society can't fix anything. People fix things. Human beings fix things fix things and it goes back to the garden of eden and they obviously were blind leading the blind they had no idea they were just going around in circles trying to find an answer but the answer goes back to what happened in the garden of eden where we are told that adam and eve fell from grace and god told them the consequences of that action when he said uh, he said you know we're going to put you out of the garden we're going to have to deal with this sin issue and he said um, to the man, he said, you know, by the sweat of your brow now, creation will be against you. You'll have to struggle to survive. And he said to the woman, and you will always be subject to this man. And when God said that, it's, it's the curse of the fall, that the relationship that he had intended for man and for woman to be co-heirs with Christ, to be co-equals with different roles, with different places in that relationship. But he called us to be equal and co-heirs of grace. And so that relationship got broken. And it's only in Christ, and it's only in the new Adam, Jesus Christ, and in the way Jesus treats us and calls us to a standard that we see the restoration of biblical manhood and biblical womanhood coming together as co-heirs of grace in Christ, carrying the different components we do, but there's hope for us in nothing else. And so society as an idea and as a thing can't save um, our relationships, only Jesus can. So let's look at the, the heart of God that's reflected in the woman and in, and in womanhood, and we're celebrating that today. I just pick out a couple of things. Firstly, um, we always, I think, um, predominantly see the initiative of compassion is in, is in the woman. And uh, although Christine didn't mention it, our missionary from Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, very often relief agencies help the women because they're very sure that they're going to help the children and help the village or, or wherever. So compassion and mercy are features of, of biblical womanhood. And we see that in just again and again in scripture. We see <clears throat> a, a responding heart, a responding heart. And we see an emotional uh, heart that will be sort of moved to compassion, moved to mercy, all of those things. And then when we look at Genesis chapter one, we see that we are made in the image of God. The Bible tells us that. But we're made male and female. And so in, um, in Romans chapter 8, and I've put my phone down over there. Julie, can you just bring it to me? Thanks. Romans 8. I've got this Bible verse lined up. Just give me a sec. Here's the heart of God that we see so often reflected, and we see it in the story of Hannah. For Romans 8, verse 24, it says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what they have? Verse 25, But if we hope for what we do not see, this is the story of Hannah, we wait for it with patience. Verse 26, and it's kind of like he goes from how we feel and how Hannah must have felt in 1 Samuel to how God feels. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. See, that's what mothers do. They help us in our weakness. They pick us up when we're crying, dust us down, give us a kiss and a hug, and send us on our way. For we do not know what we are to pray <clears throat> for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. 
So the heart of God is a heart of compassion. And it's, and it's so easily reflected and seen in the mother heart. It's interesting, isn't it, when it comes to things like the prophetic gift. Very often, women are very at the front of the queue for prophetic gifts. When we look at mercy ministries, when we look at, you know, some of those things where it requires a, a move of God in the heart of people, it's very often the women that come forward at, with the mercy response that we need to have as a church. And that's fantastic. And um, so look at with me just for a moment at 1 Samuel. Catch my breath, pause for a moment. Now, there was this guy, I'm paraphrasing bits of it, called Elkanah. And he had two wives. So we could just stop there, can we say, okay, what's the problem with this picture? Just there it is. He has two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. So the story unfolds, and it would be very easy to say, oh, this story is all about Hannah being childless. Well, it is. That was the issue, or that was the presenting problem. She didn't have children. But the real issue is emotional pain, uh, fallout, rouse, arguments, uh, shame, all of these other things that get focused in on this one cultural issue, which in those days was she didn't have any children. And so her heart is broken by this. And with her husband and the other lady, the other wife, they used to go up to Jerusalem every year and they would worship the Lord of hosts. So clearly he was a wealthy man because he could afford to keep two families. <clears throat> And on the day of sacrifice, he would give portions to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Okay, so just pause again. Think about that. He gives one wife and her children, there's, there's your food. And then he goes to the other wife and says, here's twice as much for you. Okay, so we're getting you a Mother's Day present, but I'm going to give twice as much to this one. Okay, so you can see there were problems here, emotional difficulties. And so Hannah and Peninnah fell out with each other in this very, very difficult set of circumstances. And, it, and her rival, so now rivalries come into it, had used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So you can imagine, Pat Penaniah, that's not very nice, but think of her emotions in this story. She knows that her husband loves somebody else. It's dreadful. It's just a dreadful set of circumstances. And the Bible is very real to get in the middle of all of this and tell us what's going on. And so this effectively makes her the other woman. And, you know, think of the emotional condition of her soul in those circumstances. But the, the story does focus in on um, Hannah because she's going to give birth to a very special son, but it will be out of pain and anguish and difficulty. So remember, we're talking about Mother's Day, but we're also talking about fervent emotional prayer and there is a place for fervent and emotional prayer when we pray not all prayers are meant to be shopping lists of things we'd like to see happen sometimes God moves in our hearts and we are stirred with compassion in the way that he is in his heart and so we get the heart of God coming through the heart of Hannah in this story and so she used to, she couldn't eat. She was so sad. She would go up to these, um, to the festivals and it was awful for her. You know, you meant to go to this joyful assembly, but your heart is broken and you've got to sit amongst people singing the joyful songs and having a great time. And as Hannah's looking around, she sees all these families and she sees all of this happiness and it just accentuates her sadness. And year upon year, we're told, she goes into 
this this place which was meant to be a place of happiness but for her it's a place of lack sorrow provocation enmity and rivalry this is what the bible tells us and it's into that situation she begins to pray so this went on we're told verse seven year after year as often as she went up to the house of the lord she would she would be provoked and therefore hannah wept and wouldn't eat okay so now the emotions are getting to the physical realm she's she's she can't eat she's sick to her stomach have you ever been in a situation where the need was so great that that you couldn't eat food you couldn't think about anything else maybe a loved one is sick and maybe that's you right now today you're just so overwhelmed by your circumstances i want to tell you immediately and repeatedly god is with you in your hour of need he's with you right now and the heart you have god has for you and we're told that in romans 8 that with unutterable groans the Holy Spirit intercedes with us and for us. And so there she is, and poor old um, husband comes along again, Elkanah, and he says, am I not better <laughs> than all your need for children? And I'm thinking, Elkanah, mate, you are not helping. Shut up. You're not helping this situation. Hannah, why, are you, why do you weep? We're all happy. He's basically saying, look, we've come for a lovely day out and you're being miserable. What's wrong with you, woman? Why can't you just be happy like me? Why can't you just make me happy? You can just see it and hear it, can't you, in the story. Why do you not eat? Why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? Well, actually, in that moment, Elkanah, no, you're not. Please shut up. So after they'd eaten drunk, Hannah rose. And again, imagine... This poor woman, she has to go to a festival, she, a, a big conference. She has to eat the food because it's required for her to do that. And each morsel she's eating and she doesn't want to, she's miserable. And maybe you're coming up to a situation. And for many of us, this, this year, there will be birthdays and the person we loved is not there. There will be a Christmas and the person we love is not there. And everything will be saying rejoice, 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 but in our hearts we're sad. I want to tell you again, repeatedly, God knows your circumstance and he knows your heart and he's with you in those circumstances. And what we are learning to do as Christian people is have the heart of God for God's people and for God's world. And there are many people today who are struggling and we have to have that compassion that burdens us to pray fervently as Hannah did. So she was in, we're told in verse 10, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord. So here we start to see the story turn around. She goes from her deep depression, her trauma, her loss, her sense of shame, the, the pressure she's feeling from the other lady who herself is hurting because she's not loved. You just get the scene, don't you? I know all the women are nodding because you have the emotional intelligence to understand what's going on here. Men, we're going to catch up. We're going to get some emotional intelligence going. <laughs> and she was deeply distra distressed. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon my affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to, to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head, which was a, a kind of an Isra Israelite vow. He was going to be a Nazarene. And as she continued praying before the Lord, the priest, who was getting old and not as on it, on the ball as he should have been, looks at this woman who's praying so deeply. You can't hear her words anymore. They've gone inside and you just see her lips moving. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Again, from the depth of her emotion. And don't we read in Romans chapter 8, unutterable groans. That's what the Holy Spirit prays like. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said, how long will you go on being drunk? 
put your wine away. Okay, so now we've got the church <laughs> telling this poor woman, put, get yourself together, woman. And it just gets worse, doesn't it? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, Lord, I'm not a, oh, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Don't regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along, I've been speaking out of my great anxiety. And then that, Eli, Eli says, the only sensible thing you hear him say at this point, go in peace. Thank you, Eli. He pulled it back from zero. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. Let your servant find favor in your eyes. The woman went her way. And, and it's kind of like something broke. It says she went on her way. She ate and her face was no longer sad. And there comes a point in travailing prayer where we know by faith God has answered us. And again, if you read that Romans 8 passage, it's all about, you know, receiving a spirit of hope in your travail in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want us to learn how to pray with that authority and that power that the Spirit of God would come on us in our travail and we would know that revelation that Hannah knew and that the early church knew and that God wants you to know today of, of how to pray in the Spirit. And I believe God's calling us to this kind of fervency in our prayer. And Lord, let it not be that always our, our praying is, is the shopping list or the, or the simple cerebral, here's my words kind of a prayer, but let it get to the heart of the matter and let it get to the heart of us and let it get to the heart of God. So something of a mountain gets thrown into the depths of the sea. That's what we're called to be as the people of God. And I want to encourage you in that. So here's Hannah. She receives a word from the Lord through even the faltering lips of an, of an Eli um, chief priest. And she goes on her way, knowing God has now answered her prayers. And so they rose early and worshiped before the Lord and went back the way they'd come. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Do you know when you pray, God remembers you. God remembers your words. He remembers your heart. He remembers your desperation in your situation. And I'm speaking to someone today in that place. God hears you and remembers. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son that she called Samuel. And that name means she said, for I have asked for him from the Lord. So what is your Samuel? What is the thing you're asking from the Lord that you will present to the Lord? The story goes on to say in chapter two of one Samuel, how that when the child was born and he'd been weaned about three years old, she made him a little priestly garment and she took him to the temple. And so as we think about that story there and we think about what God wants to do, there is a context to fervent prayer. It has, a, it has a reason for being fervent. And there are things in our lives that give us reason occasionally to be fervent in our prayers. And we often see the biggest miracle in the darkest moment. And I want to encourage you with that. But there is a cost also to fervent prayer that we have to set ourselves apart for praying and for seeking the Lord. And you can't get to that place of the Lord answered me, the Lord heard me, unless you have taken time to seek his face. So I want to encourage you to do that. And then thirdly, there's the consequence of fervent prayer. And here's the consequence of it. We have to give up the thing that we desire. This is crazy. This is the crazy kingdom of God stuff now that this woman desperately wanted a child. She desperately wanted that breakthrough from God and for her circumstances to be changed. But the first thing she did was she gave it all back to God. She gave him the glory. And Jesus uh, said, and the New Testament says, whatever we ask for in accordance with his will, it shall be done. 
And so when our prayers become pure and they are seeking the purposes of God and the kingdom of God and the priority of God, we can be assured that we are heard and there will be an answer. Fervent prayer, the prayer of Hannah, the prayer of the Holy Spirit, the prayer of the church, the prayer that you need to pray when God brings you into those circumstances and we are surrounded by the need. Think not only of the last thing you desired desperately, think of the next thing you could ask for with that same fervency. What do you want to happen in the church, in your life, in the world? Pray with fervency for those things. God bless you. Let's pray now. Father, I ask that there would be today an impartation of the heart of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who himself groans with desire as Jesus wept with tears in his eyes, as Jesus prayed over those who were in need with great compassion. Lord, that heart of God that we see and celebrate today on Mother's Day, on this Women's Day. Father, bless your church, the mother in society. Bless her and do her with great grace and with a fervency that is from heaven. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. It's been great to talk to you today. Fantastic to be here at our central campus and uh, look forward to seeing you soon.